Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. If you've uh, just come in tonight, uh, we are in the middle, I should say more or less at the end, of a four-week series uh, titled Straight Talk. And this is message number four of this four-week series, Straight Talk. And tonight's topic we're looking at is Christian dating, relationships, marriage. And what I did is I pulled the college age kids, the kind of 18 to 30 age group, to see what the top four topics young people want to talk about. And so that's what we've been doing over these last four weeks is talking about these things. And so I'm very excited to dive right into this tonight. If you would, please, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to bless our time of Bible study. Father, we thank you again for your word. Your word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It actually cuts into our souls, into the deep, secret parts of our lives that no one knows about. We thank you for how powerful it is, Lord, because it is the power of God into salvation. It is the very thing that can change a man, that can change a woman, transform them into a new creation. And so, Father, I pray that you would do that now, that you would minister to us by your Holy Spirit through your word. We pray it in, the, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of the message tonight is Don't Settle. The title of the message, Don't Settle. Again, tonight we will discuss one of the most popular topics amongst young people, dating relationships and marriage, the dating process in the Christian world. And I'm here to tell you tonight that God has a plan. Yes, a perfect plan for your life. He really does. You may not know it. We may not be able to see it as we saw last week, looking at a path that we should pursue, his word, his word, knowing his word and understanding it, God's will for our lives. But he does have a purpose and specific plan for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, you know it. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God wants to give you a future and a great hope before you. He has a plan for you in life. The way the world and the movies have taught us to date is you meet someone in some random place in life and the sparks start to fly the first night, right? So you see in the movies. And, and you fall in love over a few dinners in a movie. And then we see, you know, the movie goes on. They become intimate physically, sexually. He buys you a few gifts. Yeah, she's a great trophy to show to your buddies. And you end up moving in with each other. Until you get sick of each other, then you move on to the next person and hit repeat, right? That's the process. That's how it works. That's what we see the world doing today over and over and over. Hollywood especially. They're singing songs like this. Meet me at the altar in your white dress, right? We ain't getting no younger, so might as well do this. The old people aren't laughing because they don't know the song. <laughs> I guess. I know. But it's, it's a song that they play on the radio all the time. It's been played on secular radio for years. And it's just basically saying, we're getting old, so let's get married. That's it. There's no other reason than that. Today's culture is about having all the benefits of marriage without the commitment of marriage. Men are into scoring, not marriage. And in 2011, this year, 41% of all births are to unmarried women. 41%. In 2011 as well, 41% of women have shacked up or lived with a partner. It's true. The proportion of women in their late 30s who had lived with a partner has doubled in the last 15 years to 61%, New York Times tells us. Divorce goes way up with cohabitation. Psychology Today reported the findings of Yale University psychologists that women who were cohabiting were 80% more likely to separate or divorce than were women who had not lived with their spouses before marriage. Want to know how to get a divorce? Live with the person before you're married. 80%. It goes up big time. The culture is hook up, shack up, and repeat. And that's it over and over and over. It is radically different from a godly way to pursue one another and find someone in life that will stay with you through thick and thin. One who will never stop forgiving you. One who will work through hard times to stay married and keep the relationship happy. One 
who won't leave you or the family because they are committed to God before they were committed to you. And they would never want to break the covenant and sin against their God. That's the first commitment. If a person is not committed to God, why would they stay committed to you? That's the question. As soon as I don't like you, as soon as I don't love you anymore, the movies tell us, they just move on to the next person that they love, right? How do you find this person, Josh? Well, it's not the Hollywood way, I promise you that. But as we dig into this topic tonight, I want you to know that there is no perfect template to finding your mate, but know that God does have a perfect plan. And so the template I will lay out tonight is one that I would encourage you to think through with me and see if there is good reasons, and I say that again, good reasons, why we should try and live the dating process out this way. Not sure if anyone has really laid out a general template before, but um, I've chosen to do this, just being in youth ministry for many years, seeing there is one needed. I will attempt to do so tonight. And at the end of the message, you can think it through yourself and see if it is godly, practical, and logical. And so I hope we will arrive to that at the end. Hey, when you purchase a car, you think hard about it, don't you? You go and you check out stuff and you want this and that. And hey, you check it out and you really think it through. Why? Because you're going to be locked into payments for three to five years, huh? They got you by the throat. You ain't going nowhere, right? Hey, if you buy a house, you even do more research, don't you? You really think it through. Because you're going to be locked into payments from 15 to 30 years. And you will be p making those payments for a very, very long time. Why wouldn't you think through your marriage? For this is a lifetime commitment, longer than a purchase of a car or a house. And sometimes we have young people walking around just making commitment, like it's just no big deal. It's like, oh, I want to be with this person. Why? Because oh, I like them. It's like, oh, that's it. That's how you figure it out. That's how you come to that conclusion. You think more about a car or buying a house than you do your relationship. I will talk about this again because I've been in youth ministry for about 10 years now and counseled many and seen many older men counsel the younger. I've been counseled myself. I've seen high school relationships break up and mess up many times over and some even go on to marriage. I've seen people get married and get divorced, young people in the college age, yep. I've seen from A to Z amongst the young people in this generation the way we're moving. And we need to talk about this, this is important. Maybe you're thinking, why is dating so hard to define biblically? I think it's because we don't see a clear picture in the Bible. I mean, we do see men giving dowries, working for women, kings taking women, but not a clear picture of what should happen. Adam and Eve is an okay picture, but they were in a perfect scenario, a perfect situation. It doesn't exactly move into culture in this time. But statistics tell us that 91% of all Americans will eventually get married, 91%. The church, I would imagine, even more so, because we promote it. It is what God desires for humankind. You may be asking, well, I may be called singleness, Josh. How do I know that? Remember, I talked about it last week briefly. If you do not ever want to have sex for the rest of your life, or you never want to have children, then you are probably called to singleness. That's right. Those two things. If you desire either of those two things, you're not to be single, that is not your gift, okay? Here's another question, do you wanna be married? If the answer is yes, then uh, you're not called to be single, okay? Done, right? <laughs> but first things first, why do you get married? Why should anyone get married at all? What is the purpose? I looked up this question on Google and a blog with these answers came up. What is the purpose for marriage? This guy said, to be forever unhappy, of course, <laughs> right? This guy said, it's different for different people. For me personally, it would be a partnership and security and lots of gifts. Lots of gifts, right? This guy says, for sex, period. That's it. Really? Really, you must understand that in the marriage union, you're not having sex 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You mean we have to talk to each other? Yes, yes, you have to talk. You got to build a relationship. Yes, absolutely. That's not what it's all about. Some want to get married to have kids, some for tax reasons and purposes. What is the real reason for marriage? I like what FamilyMinistries.com wrote. Understanding God's purpose for marriage is of the utmost importance. 
Because to marry and miss it is to enter into a life full of frustration and disappointment. Setting the stage for a great marital unrest. Most of us tend to marry with very romanticized ideas of what marriage is going to be. With great excitement, we anticipate the relationship that will finally meet our romantic and emotional needs. God's primary intention for marriage, however, is not what most of us imagine it to be. He has not designed marriage as a place where we can finally try to get our needs met. It's not what it's about. He has created it as something much better something far more grand than that. God intends to use marriage to accomplish a very important goal, one that is his primary goal for all Christians. God's primary purpose for marriage is to use it to help shape us into the image of his son Jesus. If we miss out on this, we are doomed to a life of anxiety and frustration. It's true. Think it through. A sinner plus a sinner does not equal less sin. Oh no, it equals a whole lot more sin. You actually end up seeing more of your sin and more of their sin. Yep, you are naked and exposed before your partner, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually in every way, shape, and form, every nook and cranny, every weird mole and awkward situation you can imagine. And so, think it through. You have a sinner plus a sinner very, very close to each other. No one has ever seen you this close in your whole life. And now, they want to start pointing out the wrongs that you're doing in the household. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, you either get holy and start forgiving, or you're getting a divorce. You better start forgiving, or you're getting a divorce. That's the only way it works. It's one or the other. More sin means more forgiveness, and somebody has to forgive A simple biblical answer that I can give for marriage is the purpose of marriage is not to fulfill selfish desires, but to glorify God by demonstrating his love to the world through marriage, the marriage relationship, as we are shaped in the image of his son by forgiving each other daily, every single day, never stop forgiving each other. It is the perfect picture of God's love to the world, to those who don't know Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God, our first message in our series. Getting married, it is for God's purpose. You can turn to Genesis chapter 2 real quick. We're going to take a look at a few verses. I'm just going to read over it, and then we'll move on. But marriage, we know, is actually a gift from God. It's not just something that gets you a tax break in America, No. It's not government instituted, I hope you know this. It is actually sanctioned sanctioned by God and by the church. It is a holy institute of God. In Genesis chapter two, verse 18, God says, it is not good for the man to be alone, and so I will make a helper suitable for him. Verse 21, while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with flesh, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, the side, and he, that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, whoa, man. No, he didn't say that. He said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Yeah, whoa, whoa man, woman, whoa, whoa, man. Okay, stop it, stop it. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Stop there. You see, marriage is a gift from God. Marriage is something that God placed all the way back in the beginning, the first gift to man. Marriage. Marriage being a gift, I believe, is not the source of happiness, but, listen, can be the highest level of happiness and love that can be attained on this earth next to our salvation in Jesus Christ. I believe it is the highest ecstasy and pleasure that a man and a woman can fulfill and understand here on this earth next to salvation. Marriage can also be the greatest disaster and hurt in life, can't it? Because it, can be the great, it has been the greatest gift, it can also be the greatest disaster. That's why the message is titled, Don't Settle. Tonight, family, I will set the bar very high. Because if I set it low, you will jump low. If I set it high, you'll jump higher. If I set it low, you will settle low. And so, 
Don't settle it all tonight, please. Listen closely and walk through this journey with me. We're gonna have a blast diving through this stuff. I have six major points for you tonight. I wanna walk you through the journey of dating and finding a mate. We will start at preparing for marriage and we will end with the promise of marriage. Preparation all the way to the promise of marriage, all right? You guys ready for this? Number one, the preparation. There's six Ps tonight and the first one is the preparation. Let me ask you the question, are you prepared for marriage? In church, it is very easy for marriage to become an idol you start to think that you are a second-class citizen if you're not married, <laughs> you know? But preparation starts with your relationship with God. Yes, first. Your first check mark. It's to make sure that your relationship with God is number one in your life. You need to find your main source of joy and happiness from Him, from the Lord Jesus. Do not think that marriage will be the ultimate source of happiness. Be fully satisfied with God first. If you're not fully satisfied in God, it will probably, it probably isn't a good idea for you to try and pursue a relationship because you'll end up trying to be satisfied in that person instead of God. You ever see this? Many of us have been there. I've been there. It's true. The person becomes the God. The person can almost become an idol. You become so infatuated with the person because the relationship with God isn't right that you start worshiping them more than God. You spend more time with them than you do with the Lord. All of a sudden you stop going to church and then you stop fellowshiping with your friends and you stop reading your Bible, you stop praying and you wonder why your relationship with God is sour. How is your relationship with Jesus? Praying, walking, reading with him, growing with him spending time with him. It should be number one first. If you're not close to Jesus, don't worry about getting married. Worry about growing closer to Jesus. Very important. Matthew 6, you know it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Don't worry, you'll be married before you know it. You just seek the Lord Jesus with all your heart. Family, the question you should not be asking is, where is the right person for me? But you should be asking, am I the right person? What makes you think a godly person wants you? Are you godly? Do you love Jesus? Why would they be attracted to you if you're not godly? It's interesting how we so desire the most godly person, but we don't desire to become the most godly person. Are you prepared for marriage, brothers? Brothers, marriage is not for, me not for boys. It is for men. I approach the men because you have the most preparation as you are called to lead your home. Did you know that? You were called to lead your home. Did you know that? You were the one. The Bible puts the burden on. Yes, you. Number one, there are three things you are to do. Three things, this threefold process that kind of happens for the man. Number one, a man leaves his mommy and his daddy. Yeah. Yeah. Boys? A man leaves his mommy and his daddy. That's right. Number two, he leaves, he grows up, and he becomes a man. That's right. It's very difficult to become a man when your mom is paying for everything. Yes, it's true. And number three, he marries and enjoys his wife. This is the process. That's how it works. And I want to try and show you how I hope to. I don't have children yet, but I hope to one day raise my children, help them to understand and prepare them for marriage. I think if I paint this picture, it will help everyone to understand a little bit better how to prepare. This is how I will try, and again I say try to teach my children. I would highly encourage them not to date in high school because they are not ready for marriage, right? Are they ready? No, they're not ready. Huh? Do they have a place to stay? Do they have a home? What are they going to do? Get married? Six, who's going to take care of you? Oh, we're going to move in mom and dad's house. That's what we're going to do. Oh, okay, okay. So I'd like to strongly encourage them. Now, it, it doesn't always work out that way, but I would strongly encourage them. If you're not ready for marriage, why date? You're wasting your time and giving yourself away to people you're, who are not your spouse. And you're having lots of heartbreak. I've been there. And this comes from watching hundreds of young people in relationships do dumb things they regret. It's sad. You remember, many of you who chose to start dating in high school and your heavy heartbreak, you thought your world was falling. You thought you were going to die in that moment, huh? 
Uh, he left me. Uh, he cry, he cry. And the guy, I can't believe she did that, man. I can't. Right? It's hilarious when we look back on it. But what are we doing? What are we doing? We barely know how to tie our shoes, and we're trying to be in a relationship, you know? We haven't even graduated high school yet, and we're going to get married. But if I had a daughter, and she was 18 out of high school, and she had her eyes on Jesus and wanted to get married and was ready to get married, I'd give her my blessing as long as, as long as the guy is prepared. If I had a daughter and you wanted to date her, things I would want to know as a father. Guys, you ready? Do you love Jesus with all your heart? Say yes. Show me. Show me. I want to see that you love Jesus with all your heart. How long have you been a Christian? Do you serve in the church? Tell me about your family. Are they Christians? Tell me about your friends. You can't tell me you're a Christian all you, you can tell me you're a Christian all you want. That doesn't make you a Christian. You can tell me a millionaire all you want, but I want to see your bank account, buddy, okay? I want to know. I want to see it. Let me see your good works and start glorifying your Father in heaven because your light shines so brightly and I'm so blessed to have you. Do you have a job? How much do you get paid? This is how much I get paid. And I take care of my daughter, how much do you get paid? Are you gonna take care of her? Do you have a car? Have you ever been on your own, away from your parents? Do you have money in the bank? Do you have debt, how much? You're gonna be taking care of my daughter, buddy. I'm not gonna let you get her into some crazy trap and bring her down this deep road and path of destruction. Are you diligent with all that God has given you? This bar is kinda high, huh? Like, geez, Josh, yeah. I raise it high so that you will jump higher. And finally, how much do you bench press, right? <laughs> because if you're in an alley with my daughter and she's your wife, she better not be sticking up for you, buddy, okay? Okay, you better be ready to do some work if you need to, all right? None of this like, oh, no, there's a guy. Honey, let's run. Come on, let's go. Yeah. We're not doing that, all right? But Josh, I'm skinny. Yes, yeah, so as I get in the gym and pump some weights, all right? Make it happen. You need to be able to protect her. That's right. Hey, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. I gave it up. Brothers, you need to give it up. You need to leave childish ways and become a man. Check this out. Average man, 18 to 32, spends an average of two hours and 45 minutes a day playing video games. You serious? Is this really happening in our society? Brothers, a good pickup line is not, hi, my name is Joey. I'm a guild leader in World of Warcraft 3. <laughs> She's not impressed, all right? I got 30, 30 kills on Xbox a day. Aren't you impressed, honey? Like, you need to put the Star Wars pajamas away and become a man, okay? It's sad in this society. It really is. We laugh at these things, but this is the reality. Why 60, 70 years ago are the boys who are 13, 14 years old like running the farm, and today they're like, 23 years old, you can't get him out of bed to go get a job. What's going on here? You need to grow up and become a man. Too many guys have men's bodies and incomes, but they're, they have a mind of a boy. Brother, you need to leave your house. You need to live on your own. You need to become a man, and then you can find your wife. Godly women don't want little boys to lead their home. It's true. You, my brother, you, my friend, are called to be a king, a provider, a pastor of your home, are you prepared to protect your family? Are you prepared to make godly decisions for your family? Are you prepared to provide for your family? Are you prepared to lead your family in the ways of God, to teach them and to observe all that Jesus has commanded you? If the answer is no, you're not ready for marriage. And I would tell that boy, if you want to marry my daughter, go get those things in line and then come back and talk to me. It's cool. Just go get those things in line. I like you. You're a good guy. Just go get those things in line. Come talk to me. I'll help you with this. Well, Josh, I didn't have a dad. He didn't teach me those things. That's okay. 
Now you're accountable. Now you know. We're talking about it tonight. Learn these things, brothers. Understand them. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, if you are the head of the home and cannot provide for your family, you're worse than a non-believer because even non-believers provide for their family. We've got to do this. We've got to work hard, as hard as we need to, to make it happen. You are called, your role is to love your wife like Jesus loves us. That's your calling. That is the highest calling. What pressures we have as men. That's why we've got to step it up. We've got to rise to the occasion. Get prepared. If you were my son, I'd strongly encourage you and help you to get these things in line, and then I would gladly bless you and your bride-to-be. Girls, your pre preparation is a little different. Your role and goal is to be a godly woman like Proverbs 31. I don't have a lot of time to go into it tonight and break down the passage how I'd love to, but please go home and just read the chapter. You see a powerful woman who loves God, and she is praised by her family and also by the scriptures. But you women should be preparing to be a mother and a wife. Girls, I know this isn't politically correct. Stay with me. But we don't need more business women. We need more mothers in this society. The society is falling. Your children don't care about your success in business or whatever you do. They don't. They just want a mom who loves them and spends time with them. And guess what? Us guys don't know how to be moms, okay? We're clueless. What, what, I mean, you, you hand me a baby, what am I going to do? Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. But you ladies, man, you have power. It's been built in your DNA. You know how to do this so well. You see a, a mother with a baby in her arms. Oh, it's the perfect picture. We need you to prepare yourself to help us men raise godly families and children. The highest praise a woman receives in life is when her family praises her. It's grandma, you know? The grandma who's been serving the family for years. And everybody just says, Grandma, you are the best. Thank you so much for what you do. Amen. If you were my daughter and had these things in order and brought a man home, like I described, I would gladly bless you and your husband-to-be. Get prepared before you even think about getting married. Get prepared. There's three things in preparation I want you to start to think about before stepping into the relationship. Three things really quickly. Body, spirit, and soul. That's what you're made up of, body, spirit, and soul. Okay, the body must line up. The physical, you should be attracted to the person. Huh? Yeah, that's okay. Can you say that in church? Absolutely. You should be attracted to the person. Remember what Adam saw, said when he saw his wife? Whoa, man, because she was, she was smoking, man. She was hot, okay? He was attracted to his wife, absolutely. And please don't be offended by this. Please receive this as a church. Listen to me. Work hard to take care of your bodies. Your body is the temple of God, and you need to be healthy for your family. I'm not saying you need to be a model or some bodybuilder, but you need to take care of yourself and be healthy. Family, how do you expect to attract someone if you don't take showers, you don't have good hygiene, okay? Deodorant is good, brothers. It really is, okay? Toothpaste, superb. If you're saying something, <laughs> stay with me. If you're saying something like, I don't need to take care of my body, my spouse will love me for who I am. Your spouse is probably not stoked to hear that. Okay, hint, hint. Okay, who wants to marry the person that says, oh, you love me for who I am, so I don't need to try to look good or smell good or nice for you or any of those things. I'll just be a couch potato the rest of my life, and you'll love me, right? You're like, oh, yes, I'll love you. <laughs> Number two, your spirit must line up. Yeah, you should be physically attractive, but hey, your spirit should line up your spiritual life and mind. You not only need to find someone who loves God more than you, but that thinks biblically and spiritually the same direction. If one is saying, I want to be a missionary in Africa, and the other is saying, I want to stay in California and raise a family, you're in trouble, okay? If one of you is a Pentecostal who loves to dance, and the other is Baptist who doesn't dance, you're in trouble, okay? <laughs> that was a joke, come on. You might have some problems though, okay? Number three, the soul must line up. Personally, you should line up. Your personality. You should like to do a lot of the same things and enjoy being friends. I hate when I hear things like, I love you, but I don't like you. 
Your spouse should be your best friend above all friends and family. You should enjoy talking to them and spending time with them above all people. It's true. And that's hard sometimes, especially when you've been together for many years. It takes work. You gotta start having date night again. Honey, we're going out on a date. Huh? Yep, we're going out on a date. Okay, good. Yeah. It's good. These three things need to line up. Very important foundation. If you're missing one, you will have problems. Can you imagine not being attracted to your spouse? But they're so spiritual. Can I have a kiss? No. <laughs> That's not, it's not good. We need these things to line up. It's important. Okay, so we've looked at, number one, the preparation. Are you prepared? Number two point is the patience. The patience, how to find your rib. How to find your rib. Ultimately, when your eyes are on the Lord Jesus, God brings your mate. So what should I be doing, Josh? I am that person, I'm single and I feel like I'm ready, what should I be up to? You should marry the church. Put on a ring, friend. Marry the church, serve in the church, go to Bible study, worship the Lord and hang out with friends. Meet people. What if I'm not a social person? Become one. Now I know some people are more aggressive than others, but there's no such thing as a solo Christian. And we need to have fellowship in the church. Where's the best place to find your rib, to find your mate? The church. The church, not a singles bar, that's not a good place. The church is the best place to get married. Absolutely, I encourage it 100%. What if I'm doing all those things, Josh? Then you're in the right place. And God will bring your mate in his time. They won't come too early and they won't come too late. You can't slow down the process, you can't speed it up. Don't even try. I know, I'm gonna make this happen. No, you're not. Oh, Jesus, taking forever. What's, why is God so slow in this? He's not slow. I'm reminded of my friend Steve Kumar, Dr. Steve Kumar. Such a blessing. I think he was something like 33, 35. He's a doctor, went to school, got his degree, did the whole gig, money in the bank, how everything's taken care of. He's a prestige guy. I mean, this guy is awesome. One of the guys I've looked up to here at this church. But it's like, what's the deal? He's like 33, 35 years old, still not married. He's, he's a stud. Any, any dad would want this guy as his son-in-law. Well, it just wasn't the Lord's timing, and man, the Lord brought him his mate right on time because there was a woman who was the same age, had done the same thing. She's a professional, she's a powerful woman in the church serving on the other side of town, didn't even know about each other, and they came together. I'm telling you, you just look at them, and it's like, like you were born to be together, man. You guys are perfect together in every way. Both parents, listen, both parents had been praying since they were babies to find the perfect person for each other. It's powerful. It's awesome. Three different ways to date that we see in the Bible. Number one, prearranged marriage. Old Testament. Some cultures still practice this, even Christians. I think it's a good mindset, but it just doesn't work practically in our society. Because think about it, I got a good family, you got a good family, we're gonna raise some good kids. I think that our kids should get married one day. Hey, it's the family looking out for the kids and it's a great investment, it's a good idea. But it doesn't work practically in our society. The second way to date is non-Christian dating. This, newsflash, is not good and not appropriate and the Bible actually forbids it. You are not to be unequally yoked with a non-believer, ever. But they're so nice, nope. This does not encourage godliness. If you date according to the culture, it actually takes away from your family and getting to know the mate and the family's house. It puts boys and girls in situations away from home. The man picks her up and buys her dinner. In a movie, this is a non-Christian dating. Guys think because he is spending money on her that she should, he should be expecting sexual favors. And this is ultimately prostitution, isn't it? He buys her dinner and then he expects something from her. But the girl gives in because she really likes this guy and wants to keep him. Cultural standards of beauty creates an industry of women to be a product. Meat. Magazines telling you what you should wear, ladies, and how to sexually please your boyfriend, how you should look. And this is bad advice, wrong advice. Shouldn't be reading these magazines and listening to the world's philosophies. Here is your guide, the perfect way of doing things. Follow those magazines in those ways and you'll be depressed, you will be bummed, and you will wonder why. 
Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, oh yes, she shall be praised. In the 60s, Playboy magazine came out, and now there is this expectation of women to look like the pictures. And so women, whether you walk around with clothes on or off, there is this expectation to be sexy or you won't be liked. All of these things ultimately promote birth control, abortion, and unwanted pregnancies. And this eventually reshapes sexuality. It reshapes our culture and what we think sex is to be. Brothers, the more you look at porn, the more you think sex should be like that. And your wife should look like that and act like that. And then when you get married and she doesn't act like that, you look down on her. She doesn't look like that, she doesn't act like that, you think there's something wrong in your marriage bed. The problem is your mind, that's what's wrong. You've been washing your mind in the wrong thing. Wash your mind in the Word of God. This is the guide. If you have been indulging in that for a long time, you must cut it off. If your eye causes you sin, pluck it out and throw it away. Start washing your mind in this. Restore your mind. Allow the pureness of God's Word to come back into your life. God made sex. And the Bible teaches that this is the right way of having sex and doing it God's way is in the marriage covenant. God made sex to be like, guess what? Like a warm fireplace, something that is wonderful and pleasurable and a blessing. When you take, it, when you take sex out of the fireplace, out of the institute of marriage, you know what it does? It burns your house down, yep. It burns the whole thing down. You wonder why our society is in such shambles. It's because of this. You can do non-Christian dating, but it doesn't work. It's sad. The third way of Christian dating is courtship. The family is included, primarily the dad. And there's, we know that a man needs to leave his family and take a wife. And the model of courtship is that a guy pursuing the girl needs to first date the dad. Did you know that? Come on, son, let's go on a date, me and you. Let's go, come on. Right? I'm just kidding. He needs to talk to the dad, though. He needs to get permission first. The dad is to be the model of how the husband should be in his daughter's life. The dad is the first man in her life, and the dad gives permission who will take his daughter's hand. Yep. I will be the first man in her life, and I will give permission to whom will take her hand. And I hope that she, if I can say it in this way without sounding weird, dates me, I hope to take her out on dates even so, and show her what it means, to, what a real man is supposed to be, and that she would expect nothing less. And so that she would be in union with me and be excited, and when guys come around who want to date her, who don't even come close to that standard, she just blows them off like, Psh, you got some work to do, buddy. <laughs> right? But when the dad does not take the role in the daughter's life, oh, she goes looking around, and any boy who gives her attention, she runs to but I hope she gets so much attention from her father that even the greatest man would not satisfy her, only the Lord Jesus. So we've looked at the preparation, the patience, and how to find your rib, and number three, we look at now the pursuit. Are you ready? The pursuit in approaching your rib. We need practical things because young people, young guys just don't know. I'm gonna give you seven quick points within the pursuit in finding your rib, and so here it goes. Number one, don't pursue a relationship until you're in a season of life to get married. We already talked about this. Are you in school, a doctor? Are you struggling with something? Is your relationship not right with God? Don't pursue marriage. Hold off on it, okay? This is general, but if you can't see yourself married in one to three years, I don't think it's wise to start dating a person because just because you're lonely just because you want a friend or someone to be close to, or because you're attracted and like each other, it's not a good reason. There are many problems that come with dating without intention of marriage. Heart's broken, one person is ready and the other one isn't. One thinks this is it, this is marriage, and the other one doesn't. Some people get hurt, I've seen it hundreds of times. Dating without intention of marriage also breeds sin, did you know that? You become friends, you hang out all the time, then you kiss, you start getting physical, then you realize you've been with this person for a year and they're not the one for you, but you built so many memories and you love them and you're attached so you won't get out of the relationship for fear of loneliness and all the drama that comes with it, and you sit 
in the wrong relationship because you didn't date with intention for marriage. There should be intention. None of this playing stuff. We don't play date. We don't play marriage. Intention for marriage. Some relationships drag on for years. How does that work? If you're, not, if you're ready to get married, you start dating to get married. If you're not ready to get married, don't start dating, lest you fall into this trap. Some people say, we're just taking our time. Really? Ten years of dating? How do you stay pure? Maybe your relationship is somehow staying pure, but how about your heart? Does it take ten years to figure out if you're supposed to marry that person? Or was it you weren't ready to get married when you started dating and now you're stuck? Emotionally connected, physically connected, spiritually connected, and can't let go. Basically, married because of so much time spent together without the blessing and luxuries of marriage. That's hard and difficult on a person. Some people like to move really fast. You ever seen that? They like to say, well, so-and-so only dated his wife for like three weeks and then they got married. That's not a good example. It's a terrible example. We praise God those relationships work out. But out of a thousand people who did the same thing and got married after three weeks, how many do you think survive? Not very few. Let me pose this question to you. What is the purpose in rushing to the altar? Give me one good reason. There's none. If you can give me one good reason, I will give you 50 awesome reasons why patience and taking your time is very wise and appropriate. Love is patient. It doesn't seek its own. Here at Harvest, we will not marry you unless you've been together for a year. That is the wisdom of the old men of this church who have seen thousands of relationships come through. And with the divorce rate rising, it's a great, great place. The foolish man takes things fast because he wants it now. He wants his flesh satisfied now. The wise man takes his time and prayerfully thinks it through. I hear people say, God told me I'm supposed to marry her this week. Oh, really? Yeah, I got three verses to back it up, bro. Okay, okay gotcha, gotcha. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> Just don't you end up in the, my office next week, okay? That's what happens. Song of Solomon 2.7 says, do not awaken love until the time is right. Don't do it. Don't open that box until you are ready. Don't play games. This is forever. It will forever affect you in your life. The second in the pursuit, this approaching your rib, these things will move a lot faster now. If you find someone you're attracted to in the church, yes, that's okay. You should be attracted to them. You must be attracted to them physically, romantically, sexually. This is good. God made it that way. But if you're attracted to them, I would encourage you to do this. Just watch them. Please don't be a creeper. Okay. <laughs> or a peeper. Don't do that. Or a Facebook sneaker. Don't you do that, all right? Watch them worship, watch them serve the Lord, watch them interact with people. Just watch them from a distance. Just watch to even see the relationship with the church and who they are, important. Number three thing, in approaching your rib, the pursuit, befriend them. Have a few conversations, hang out where they hang out, be their friend, because this is what your marriage will be like for the rest of your life. If you don't like them as a friend, again, put aside the way they look, if you don't like them as a friend, if you don't like the way they treat people, interact with people, when you marry them, you're in big trouble because they are going to treat you that way and act that way all the days of their life. People don't change. People don't change. I'm going to change them. No, you're not. You can't change people. I'm a pastor. I try to do it all the time, okay? Come in my office. Let's sit down and talk. It doesn't work. Only God changes people. Also, it's sad I have to point this out, but read the signs. You may like someone, but the question is, do they like you, right? <laughs> they may not like you, and that's okay. You gotta be okay with that. Just walk away, pray and seek God. Side note, run this past your friends and family to see what they think. In the friendship process, you should allow those closest to you to examine the person you're watching. They love you and know what's best for you, right? A lot of people like say, no, no, I'm going to do this thing on my own. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing on my own. Don't you try to look into my relationship. Don't you try to tell me what I need and what I don't need. Hello? There's wisdom in the counsel of many, is there not? Proverbs tells us. Why would you reject the counsel of people who love you the most and who love God? Check with your friends and family before you fall for this person blindly. 
Godly friends and family should be on board with your timing and choice of person. Number four in the pursuit, approaching your rib, is for guys only. Girls, okay, sit back, you're okay, just kick back. Guys only. Girls should not be pursuing guys. Nope. No cougars in this place. Nope. <laughs> Girls, it's okay to make yourself available and seen. Please don't hide in a room for the rest of your life and expect God to bring your man. But don't walk up and say, hi, I'm single, desperate, and here's my number. Okay. <laughs> don't do that, all right? Brothers, this is for you. If you are ready, prepared to get married, and you have been watching a girl, and you can see she loves God, and you have befriended her for a couple of months. What's a couple months, Josh? You gotta know. What's a couple of months? Like two to three, you know, maybe six months, okay? You like who she is. You can tell she likes who you are. You've talked to your friends and family about this person. Go and ask her out, you fool. What are you waiting for? Why are you being such a sissy? Step it up, man. To what? What should I do? How do I say it, Josh? You just walk up and say, hi, how's it going? You know, we, we've been, I really like you as a person. You know, you're a great friend. I'd like to know if you'd like to go get some coffee or go on a bike ride or go to the beach. Yeah, those are good ideas. Let me write those down. Good job, good job. Or some lunch, maybe, some lunch. What kind of lunch places, Josh? Girls like Panera Bread, brother. Panera Bread is a great shop. Huh, girl? Huh? Huh? Can I get a clap for that? Huh? I'm just kidding. Don't clap for that. Nordstrom Cafe is great. Coffee is great. Okay, coffee shop. Don't take her to McDonald's, brothers. That's not good, okay? Come on, get you a double-double. I mean, that's not... Okay? Ladies, they need the practical things. They really do. I promise you that, okay? But caution. Don't break her heart. Think about what you're doing before you ask her out. Are you ready for her to start thinking, especially a woman who is prepared for marriage, are you ready for her to start thinking, could this be my husband one day? It's a possibility. Girls, be approachable. There's no need for a game to be played. If you're ready to get married, make yourself available to the guy you like. If you're not ready for marriage, no dating, no making self available. If you're not ready for marriage, don't do that. Tell the guy no and that you're not ready for marriage. Don't waste his time or yours, please. Don't do that. Let's look at number five here in the pursuit. Brothers, if she says yes after you ask her out, don't overreact, okay? Play it smooth, play it smooth, all right? Play cool, play cool. Okay, you don't go, yes, 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 yes. Yes, I praise you, God. Thank you. You brought me a wife. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> Just say something like this. Pick you up a six. <laughs> right? Just play it smooth, okay? <laughs> Number six, the pursuit approaching your rib. rib. Hygiene and looks. Brothers, please brush your teeth. Take a shower. Dress in something nice. Put on some cologne. Have money in your pocket. Get your car washed and cleaned before picking her up. Make sure you open the door for her everywhere at all times possible. And guess what? You always pay the bill. You always pay the bill. Always. That's right. And the girls clap because they love that. And sure, there's those times, you know, it's a, oh, um, I forgot my wallet. <laughs> right? It happens, but brothers, you pay. Number seven, and finally, in this pursuit point, approaching your rib, after you and your friend have gone on a few dates and you like each other and you have been friends for a while, you need to go talk to her father and ask if you can court her with intention for marriage. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to get married but it does mean that it's possible and that you're serious and not goofing around with a man's daughter. You need to be honest with him, and I guarantee he will be so stoked that you come to him and ask him for her hand in marriage, but if you come and ask him if you can even start to court and pursue his daughter, wow, what joy will bring his heart, huh? It's a good thing. If the dates don't work and you find out there isn't a mutual attraction, no one gets hurt, and you can remain friends, and that's the beauty of this. It is when you move too fast that people get hurt and you get stalkers. Girls, please be honest and upfront with guys. We're blockheads. We're dumber than a box of rocks, okay? We love to read into things, as do girls. So guys, be gentle with the girls as your sisters in Christ and let them know the truth about the relationship. Define the relationship. Define the relationship with them. Very important. Define it. Good to say things like, I'm happy that we're just friends right now. And then... 
you should tell them, I like you, and I would like to pursue something. And then, the next point, moving on to courtship, it's something that you should define and be very loud and obnoxious about. It's a good thing to commit. It is a good thing to pursue. We have looked at the preparation, the patience, the pursuit, and now the process of courtship. The process of courtship, number four, in defining the relationship, brothers, is when you call her your girlfriend and you are committed to her and her alone and no one else on the face of the earth. It's true. It's a very serious thing. It's a good thing, especially in Christian dating in the church. In the world, it's like, whatever. It's just no big deal. But in the church, it is business, big time. Commit. You need to commit. You should pray together when your boyfriend, girlfriend, it's okay to pray together, it's okay to read together, go to church together, be friends, hang out, and watch this person closely. Don't hang out in situations that will cause you to compromise purity. Set standards in the relationship. Set standards, it's good. You need to figure out what standards you need for your relationship, but I think they're appropriate. I think you know, a lot of people like to make fun of, oh, they don't even kiss. What's wrong with them in the church? They, they, they've, they've put these standards on their life. And then once you start kissing and you find yourself messing around sexually, you're like, oh, maybe we shouldn't kiss. Okay, let's stop doing that. Hey, you figure out the standards for your relationship and establish those things. Always be honest with each other, 100%. I think if you can start this at the beginning, at the beginning you're going to have a blessed marriage. 100% honesty. And if someone has been dishonest, even in the beginning, it should be dealt with in a loud manner, in a loud fashion. Like what, Josh? It should be talked about seriously. Let's talk about this. I don't want there to be any dishonesty between us. Let's sit down. Not even one ounce, not one drop. You're my best friend. I want to have complete honesty and open doors with you. Get to know their family. The four Fs, Mr. J. Mr. Johnston gave me in high school, he was my geometry teacher, he said this, four things that you will struggle with in marriage. If you don't have these four things lined up, get ready for some struggles. Number one, the four Fs. Number one F is faith, you gotta have the same faith. Number two is friends, you gotta be best friends. Number three is finances, you gotta have finances. And number four is family, you gotta be good with their family. Those are the things you will get, you will struggle about and people get divorces about in this day. I highly encourage you to be with a person for one year before proposal. Do you really know a person enough less than a year to be married to them forever? Fighting. It's good to fight. Did you know that? People come into my office. We've never fought before. We have the best relationship. Nope. <laughs> you do not because guess what? Fighting will come. There's two sinners in the same house. It's going to happen. And so when you get, when I can see that a, that a relationship is actually fought and they're working through problems, wow, look at that. Solving problems and working through things and forgiving each other, that's powerful, that's good. It takes time to do that. Okay, so we've talked about the preparation, the patience, the pursuit, the process of courtship, and now the proposal. Yep, the proposal, getting down on one knee, brothers. You can get, get down on one knee, yes you do. You've got to. Real quick, number one, first thing you gotta do with the proposal, you gotta go big on the ring. Okay, brothers, you don't wanna mess this one up. Just go big, okay? Save up, stop in money, spending money on dumb stuff, okay, like video games, and go save up for a nice ring, okay? She'll really like that, okay? And her friends will like it too, they'll go nuts, all right? Number two, go talk to dad. Go get his okay and show him the ring. Show him the ring, you mean business. Look at that, I got this in order, dad. I, I want to have your daughter in marriage. I talked to you a year ago, and now I'm here to, I'd like to propose to your daughter. And then number three, you gotta go big on the proposal, brothers. Go big, okay? You gotta go huge. Pastor Jeff was saying, man, he, uh, he teaches here on Wednesday nights, and one of our admin pastors here at the church, he sat me down and said, Josh, when you do the proposal, you gotta go huge. I'm like, huh? Yeah, you gotta go big, man. None of this sissy stuff, right? The same old, same old. You gotta go big. I'm like, okay, Pastor Jeff. All right, I'm gonna do this. And so this is what I did. 6 a.m. on the beach. That's when I proposed. 6 a.m. on the beach, but it didn't stop there. After that, I faked it like we were going down to meet with my dad for breakfast. And what did I do? We went on a horseback ride on the beach for like two hours. It was awesome. Then after that, we went and got some lunch and had a good time down there in San Diego. 
think it's over? Oh, no. Then we go right there at, uh, at, at the, uh, the heights there in San Diego, and uh, we go on a, and a, a hot air balloon ride that overlooks the whole ocean, man. It was the sickest thing ever. It was amazing. And then after that, we went and had steak dinner with the family and celebrated together. And man, it was a long day, but I will never forget it, and I will never regret spending all that money. It was absolutely worth it. Brothers, you got to go big. You got to take it to the next level, okay? We got the preparation, the patience, the pursuit, the process, the proposal, and number six, and finally, the promise for life. The marriage. Ephesians 5, there are just two simple commands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's it. That's it. You've got to love her like Jesus loves the church. Look at the church. They're a mess. Do we love God back perfectly? Oh, no. Aren't we rebellious? Oh, yeah. Well, she doesn't do this and she doesn't do that. Love her as Jesus loves the church. The church doesn't do this and the church doesn't do that. And you need to love her regardless. You love her unconditionally. Wives, it says, just submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. That's your command. That's what you're called to do. That is the marriage relationship. Marriage is the picture. We're going to close this down right now. But marriage is the picture of Jesus loving his church. Jesus said this. I did not come to this world to be served, but what? To serve and give myself as a ransom for many. You know what marriage is? Service. It's just serving each other. It's serving each other. It's washing each other's feet. If you got into marriage so that the other person would serve you, you missed it. He did not come to be served. No, he came to serve. When you choose in the marriage relationship, when you choose to start serving your mate, that's when everything's going to turn around. When you expect service, you're going to have problems. You've got to learn to serve them. And can you see that? Can you see that picture? She serves him, and he serves her, and then she serves him, and he serves her, and she serves him, and he serves her. And they're just like awesome marriage because they keep serving each other. None of this, ex no expectations on each other. You didn't do this and you didn't do that. Nag, nag, this, that, that. Just serving and loving and ministering to each other. Now, does it work out that way easily? No, it doesn't. But true love is nonstop forgiveness. And one of my favorite pastors, Mark Driscoll, he gives a sermon illustration that when, when he does weddings and the two people stand between him, he says, Husband, wife, there are just one thing that will come between you two. It is this, sin. And depending on what you do with sin to each other is how your marriage will go. You will sin against each other constantly. And if you try and punish each other because of the sin, instead of looking to the cross and see the one who was punished for that sin and choose to forgive the other, you'll be in great trouble if you don't do these things. It's easy. It's simple. You're going to sin against each other. If you choose to forgive, you're going to do fine. If you choose not to forgive and punish the other person for their sins, because Jesus was already punished, but you choose to punish them, bitterness will start. Yep. And bitterness turns into cancer in your heart. And that's how you start to get separation. And you know what the greatest, the most detrimental thing that can happen to your marriage? Let me warn you, young people. It is when there is lack of communication. There is something wrong with the pipes. They're not clean anymore. There is something wrong in between you two. And you let the bitterness turn into like a callus. And then you can't break it. And you won't throw down the pride. And you can't fix it. I'm telling you tonight, if you can choose to keep those pipes open and keep saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgive you. I sinned against you. I'm not going to crucify you for it. Jesus was already crucified for that. Forgiven in Jesus' name. I let you go in that. I'm not going to hold that against you. If you can do that, you're going to have a very successful and blessed marriage. If you can't do that, you're going to go through very hard times. We have got to stop the divorce in church. Not this generation. We will not have divorce. And that is where this sermon ends tonight is that we must not settle for anything less than what God has called us to family. Oh, family. How I'd love to see this church thriving. 
and loving God, forgiving each other, powerful marriages, changing our society for the greater good. We're going to pray together and ask God to do a great work in our hearts now. Let's pray.